I'm Gil Rosman, and I'm moderating this session. It's, it's uh, been a real pleasure and honor for me to serve as the editor of the Asan Forum since the journal was founded in 2013. Uh, today, our first responsibility is to overcome the, the three uh, challenges, one being uh, a long day of meetings, another being jet lag for some, and a third being alcoholic dinner. <laughs> so we've got to be interesting. Now, I feel passionately about the subject of sharp power. So I hope that I can start us off with a sense of the importance of this new concept. And our plan is to go through uh, three country analyses, uh, and then go to a discussion of what's being done to counter it, and then the founder and organizer of the, the, the notion of thought power coming from the National Endowment of Democracy will give us some sense of uh, what, where we stand uh, in understanding this concept. So I want to say a few starting points. One, sharp power fits in to an established academic agenda. It isn't something out of the blue, even though it's a very new concept. I mean, there was an effort a few years ago by Hillary Clinton to introduce the concept of smart power. And so smart power was a way to improve soft power, to get it to work better after the Bush era had seen American soft power decline, and to sort of say, we can do better and smart power is to play on the strengths of your soft power and uh, become more attractive to other parties. Sharp power, in contrast, is an effort to uh, d disrupt, uh, often through, <clears throat> uh, through secretive, concealed ways, the, another country's soft power, another country's sense of identity. So really, in the broader academic arena, we're talking about national identities. What are their dimensions? What are the gaps in a bilateral relationship that are affected by the two identities of the, of the parties? And now, if some outside force understands the vulnerabilities of a national identity, its lack of solidarity, its uh, the threats to it from internal changes in a country, uh, from globalization, then that other party can try to disrupt it, uh, transform that national identity. And I think that's what sharp power has been uh, all about. Uh, so the second element of discussing sharp power, apart from linking it to the academic uh, background, is to talk about comparisons. And in the current issue of the Asan Forum, I think with posting expected tomorrow, or certainly by the end of the week, we have four articles on case studies of Chinese interference in liberal democracies. Uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada, and South Korea. We have with us the uh, author of the presentation on South Korea, Che Gong, uh, the vice president of the Asan Institute, and he will bring us uh, some of the conclusions from his paper. Here we have a, a second speaker going to be speaking about the Australian case, and that is the New York Times reporter, whom I, I often get up to in the morning to see what is her latest commentary on China, uh, Jane Perlez. And then we have uh, a case that has really been very little understood and discussed, the Japanese case with Professor Hosoya from Keio University. Uh, then we go to John Park talking about uh, uh, project at, at the Kennedy Center, and, and not I mean the Kennedy School, uh, my Washington <coughs> bias comes out. Um, and there will be, just, what are they doing to, to address elements of this issue? And then finally to Chris Walker uh, on, on what, what this costs are. So in other words, we're starting here today with the comparisons. 
what are the cases? And we're focusing on China. But there's important, it's, we really think of China and Russia as the two assertive advocates, practitioners of sharp power. Of course, in the United States, Russia is the primary case being uh, uh, drawing attention. <clears throat> and actually, uh, I was at a panel this afternoon when Kim Tae-hwan brought up sharp power and compared China and Russia. So uh, that was uh, very instructive, and we will have a paper uh, by two authors uh, in, the, in, our, in the Asan Forum in the next week that will also uh, make that comparison between China and Russia. Very important way of framing the issue. But finally, I want to say that sharp power is more than an academic subject to understand what are the forces that shape uh, identities and challenges of identities from one country to another in their relationship. It is a force that is proving remarkably disruptive of the liberal international order. And so we want to think ahead how disruptive can this be with cyber warfare, with information issues, with disinformation spreading rapidly, with people in their own narrow uh, silos getting information that may be fake news. What does it all mean? Where are we going with this? And I hope by the end of the panel and with your questions helping us out, we'll be able to raise some questions about the, the future impact of this. With those introductory comments, I turn now to uh, Chegan. Okay, thank you, Gil. Actually, before making my presentation, I'd like to uh, express my sincere thanks to Gil for his hard work in editing and publishing this ASAN forum. Without him, actually, it was not possible to publish all the articles. Whenever I sent my draft, he usually done it in 24 hours. I was really impressed. Oh, wow. <laughs> Jesus. <clears throat> all, all reds. <laughs> really, I, I really appreciate his hard work. So actually, we have to give him uh, actually warm applause for his hard work <laughs> at this point of time. Thank you. After that, actually, second, actually, I don't know whether I will be able to come any part of China after publishing my article in the ASEAN Forum. <laughs> I'm not kidding, actually, because actually I tried to get my China specialist, my Korean China specialist to work together on this project. But actually, can I put your name on the list? I said, Kang, don't do that. I don't want to be the target of Chinese retaliation anymore. Please drop my name. Don't mention my name. That was a real case, I mean. I tried. I contacted you know, the Professor Han Seok Ki, Park Byung Wang, all these China specialists. They say they refuse to join me in this project. That actually tells what China can do to other countries. Of course, actually, whether the, the sharp power can be applied to China at this point of time, especially between the Korea and China, maybe Chinese way of interfering in Korean domestic as well as external affairs is more blunt way. But into the future, maybe they will become much more sophisticated and using this information to manipulate the reality to split the society over some specific issue. For example, that age was the case. So, China has learned some lessons over the third cases. So still, South Korea under the retaliation of Chinese sanction at this point of time. But clearly, Chinese side has recognized counterproductiveness of using this power so bluntly. So down the road, I think China will use different tools in manipulating the public opinion in other country and form pro-Chinese voice in South Korean case. So that's my hunch down the road. So at this point of time, I can tell still we are under the Chinese economic retaliation. Of course, after having the, the consultation between the two parties, which was announced last October 31st, still we have not fully recovered from our bad relation with China, still on, the, on its way, but getting better. But that actually proves China can use its power whenever it feels necessary. When the other side 
weak, that is most the prime target of Chinese retaliation. So China will seek the weakest point of each target. In this case, South Korea, for example, 2000, when there's a, kimchi, a garlic war, 2003, there's a kimchi war, now we have another economic, more comprehensive. But th those two previous cases was about the trade issue. So trade retaliation against trade issue. But this time they link trade issue with security issue. That's different. That means China will widen the area of application of its power. So it's a kind of linkage politics down the road. Second, what I can tell, China tried to build their own network of cooperation in South Korea. Over the past 27 years, China has built Confucius Institute in various schools. I think it's more than 130 nowadays. Not only in universities, but also in high schools. So they are providing some programs and, and manpower, financial support, and bring Korean scholars to any part of China and then give them opportunity to spend over there. They try to build the pro-Chinese voice inside South Korea. And also they will be provide, actually Chinese side will provide information to these people. That was the case over that issue. I asked my China specialist, where did you get all this information about that? Oh, yes, it's, it's provided by Chinese side, not from the USFK or US forces. I really stopped. So this is about not actually accurate information, but information only actually justified the, justified the Chinese position on that. That is targeted toward China, that undermined the national security interests of China. But all those information was given by the Chinese side to Korean scholars, and they, they, are the, they became the mouthpiece of Chinese authority sometime. Of course, they found some, some convincing evidence. That kind of information will be further widespread in down the road. And also they try to build the network with major politicians. And also, for example, <coughs> at this point of time, the ruling party is much, feel, feel much closer to China than to the United States, frankly speaking. So the progressive party usually have better feeling better understand, they try to have better relations with China rather than the other two parties. So there's identity there, but there's no clear linkage or kinds of official, the formalized link between these two parties, but they try to build this cooperation based upon their personal linkage. And also, sec the other point I like to raise, nowadays you can see the increased public diplomacy activities by Chinese authority in South Korea. I was really surprised to watch Ambassador Chu so, uh, the kind of congratulatory remark. He was a really shy guy. Whenever we asked him to make kinds of, sub, kinds of public appearance, he refused to come. He refused to come any conference we organized here in Seoul. But this time, he showed up. I was really surprised what's going on. He tried to create some kind of good image among South Korean public. Actually, if we go back to about a year ago, when we had the presidential election, <coughs> he approached major politicians in ruling party. And also he exposed himself to media. It was a really rare case. Usually, of course, uh, every embassy in Seoul at that point of time was so much interesting outcome of the election and who is going to be the next president of South Korea. But that was behind the scene. But he openly met the major politicians and then made some comments to be quoted by media. So kinds of creating some kinds of atmosphere which is, could be regarded much more favorable to China. The other thing I'd like to share with you, of course, Chinese side sometimes try to intervene our law enforcement activities. For example, we ha usually have a, the, the fishing boat incident and then we try to enforce our law. But behind the scenes, then sometimes they called our authority, can you apply some special treatment to these case, that was the case. I was in the blue house, and then I got a, some, actually, my friend got a phone call from the Chinese side. You caught the captain of the fishing boat. Can you release it? So, no way. We have to enforce our law. Hmm. This is violation of our domestic law. So there's some kinds of way China to distort the norms and regulations we, ha we actually have cherished for the past seven decades as, as a democratic country. So maybe that could be the case in the future. I don't know exactly. But there's always some cases that Chinese authority ask 
South Korean government to be more friendly in their treatment of such cases. So there are many things we can cite on these cases. So down the road, it seems to me that we will be very much careful about what China will do in its power. And also uh, nowadays and into the future, China will have more tools to use against the, the target country, especially South Korea. So we, but it's quite ironic to see when we stand firm, China usually listen <coughs> and try to seek cooperation with South Korea. That was the case, for example, we stood very firmly on that case, not the government, but actually public stand firm, despite all the economic loss, the, for example, Lotte or the tourism industry, we stand firm and united together. And then actually gave some, some, uh, some different understanding among Chinese how they are going to handle this issue. So down the road, it seems to me they try to appeal to South Korean public by using their information, using their network of cooperation. So how we are going to handle? There's Chinese sharp power or blunt power, stay firm and try to be very resolute in our commitment to our, non, our national interests. On, on the other end, we have to be very active in promoting public diplomas in China to create pro-Korean uh, voice in China. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Australia has been really in the <coughs> forefront of the discussion of what China has been doing to interfere in the domestic affairs. So I'm really eager to hear what Jane has to tell us about the Australian case. Jane? Thanks so much. Um, Chia Bong, I have to say thanks a lot for having us all for the 10th anniversary. It's really great to be here. Um, I feel a little bit of an imposter here. I'm not an expert on sharp power. I'm actually based in Beijing. Mm -hmm. uh, but I grew up in Australia and I go back from time to time, so I have a feel for the country. And I think it's fascinating to see, consider why China has launched such a big sharp power campaign in Australia, why it selected uh, Australia for this. And I think it's, no, it's really not surprising. Um, Australia is a big prize for China in the long run. Uh, it's a five eyes ally, ally with the United States. Uh, it's a resource laden country. Uh, that China will need to, um, for its minerals, although the mineral, the mining boom has plateaued and Australia is selling not quite what it was uh, in, in minerals, uh, it's still selling a lot of minerals to, to China and will continue to do so. And now there's a whole new industry in Australia providing China with fresh foods, oysters, seafood, um, and other items, pharmaceuticals, there's a huge, huge, many, many things that Australia has that the growing middle class in China wants. So Australia is important to China, so therefore uh, the sharp power campaign. Um, so that's the reason why. Um, what have they done? I'd say they've exercised their sharp power in a rather crude way, so crude that it's roiled, uh, really roiled the political um, atmosphere in Australia in the last year. Um, I think they could have done it a little bit more subtly and they perhaps wouldn't have uh, um, created so much attention. I should also add in the why they've chosen Australia, um, that Australia is a very fertile ground. There are about a million ethnic Chinese living in, in, uh, in Australia. There are more than 200,000 uh, Chinese students. Remember, Australia's got a pretty small population, 25 million. So there are 200,000 uh, students from the mainland China, all of whom are fee-paying students, all of whom support the university system which long ago was cut off from government funding as the main, as the main source. Uh, government, the government does not give as much to the Australian universities as it used to. So the universities have become very dependent on uh, the Chinese students. So this makes for a very 
um, one might say, vulnerable pool of people for the uh, Chinese government to try and influence. In any event, um, in the last year, the uh, Australian Prime Minister has felt compelled to say that he would, quote unquote, stand up to China's information warfare. And the head of Australia's spy agency, Duncan Lewis, warned of unprecedented efforts, uh, Chinese efforts to penetrate the government and Australian universities. They're pretty strong public words for um, a spy chief to say. What have they done? Um, the Australian Security Service tracked about $6 million in political donations to Australia's main political parties from just two Chinese businessmen with close ties to the government in Beijing. One of the donors, one of those businessmen, is chairman of the Australian Chinese group that is backed by the United Workers' Front, which is the main organ inside China that organizes the sharp power. The Australian media has reported that about 10 state and local government candidates have close ties to Chinese intelligence. A prominent senator from the Labour Party had to resign when it was found he used donations from one of the Chinese businessmen to pay off personal debts. He publicly endorsed China's claims in the South China Sea, which were, of course, uh, diametrically different to those of the Australian government. And I think most uh, conspicuous uh, Chinese, these Chinese university students, uh, many of them have been coached by consular officers on how to challenge lecturers uh, in the classroom. So there have been confrontations between Chinese uh, students and the Australian lecturers over things that the lecturers have said that the Chinese students find objectionable. Um, one University lecturer at Monash University had to resign because the university administration caved to Chinese pressure over what he had said. Um, another had to make a, a public apology about translating a warning about telling the students not to uh, cheat in exams and he, he apparently said this in Mandarin and this was found to be offensive because he was thought to be selecting the Chinese students. And the atmosphere has become so poisonous that dozens of visits by, um, expected by Australian uh, university uh, presidents to go to China have been cancelled. So all of this has promoted, has, has resulted in a backlash uh, within the Australian political system. New laws are being proposed that ban foreign campaign contributions. Uh, to candidates. It's actually quite surprising to me that this hasn't been done before, but it was the Chinese um, donations to political campaigns that have spurred this new legislation. Um, and Australia, I think in reaction to all of this, uh, declined to sign on to Belt and Road. Um, the, Australia, the Chinese government made a formal uh, presentation on Belt and Road about last October when all of this was coming, uh, coming to the fore and uh, the Australian government said, no, thank you. Um, I think that this can best be summed up by Rory Medcalf, a professor at Australian National University, who described the sharp power efforts this way. He said, the Chinese Communist Party is seeking to suppress dissent among its diaspora in countries around the world. It uses a tapestry of methods to achieve its goals. Political donations, control of Chinese language media, mobilizing community and student groups, and engaging in coercive activities that involve Communist Party proxies and even consular officials. I think that's a pretty good summary. I will leave it there, but I just want to close with um, one uh, personal thought. I find this uh, sharp power is quite, counter is quite counterproductive. It's proving to be quite counterproductive for China. And if it, if it used some of its more soft power um, abilities and tools, it would be far better off. My illustration of this is many, many years ago, as a young Australian university student, I first went to China on a 
on a, on a university summer vacation. It was organized by China's National Travel Service. 50 Australian students got on a boat from Sydney. We sailed to Japan. We had five days in Japan, came to Hong Kong. Then we got on a train and came, came into what was then called Canton. Well, guess what? It was 19, January 1967, the height of the Cultural Revolution. And we thought that we were just going to China for a holiday, but we... To see their culture, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we arrived in the middle of all this chaos. But I have to tell you that after three weeks in China, in the middle of the Cultural Revolution, we all came away totally thrilled, totally impressed with the energy and the resourcefulness of students, everybody. We just thought it was the greatest thing. And <laughs> I've always, I, that, that attracted me to China. I didn't become a China specialist, but I always kept track of China. I always, wanted to, I always came back, you know, every five years or so. And I was thrilled that I could end up uh, in Beijing as a China correspondent for the New York Times, basically because of that soft power trip so many years ago. So I think the Chinese have a little bit to learn from that. Thank you very much. Yes. And thank you. We all benefit from that history that brought you there. Uh, <laughs> Japan is the case that I, I understand the least. It just doesn't seem to fit the usual patterns of soft power uh, and sharp power here. So I'm really eager to hear Yuichi's comments. Thank you very much, Kiel, for your brilliant, kind introduction to of this panel. And also, I'm grateful for the organizer of this conference, Asan Institute, and particularly Dr. Uh, Chegang, uh, because I'm very glad to be included in this panel, particularly because uh, sharp power is a buzzword. And in the coming years, I'm sure that we will repeatedly use this word. We will repeatedly discuss this topic. And that's why I really want to more deeply understand the situation in each country and uh, in the world. That's why I'm really grateful for, uh, for being uh, in this panel. Uh, I will talk about Japan, how much Chinese, particularly Chinese uh, sharp power, is penetrating into Japanese society and the current situation and Japanese reaction to that. And in short, I like to say that uh, uh, Chinese sharp power has been extremely unsuccessful in Japan for some reasons. First, for more than, I would say, 1,000 years, uh, we have been influenced by China, Chinese civilization. But at the same time, uh, Japan has been uh, resisting to be overwhelmed by Chinese civilization. So Japanese national identity or well, the creation of Japanese national identity is closely linked to the resistance to be overwhelmed by Chinese civilization. Because undoubtedly, uh, for many centuries, the Chinese civilization has been predominant in East Asia. So it's very easy to be overwhelmed, to be occupied, or to be uh, dominated by this uh, quite attractive uh, civilization. But it's quite attractive, but at the same time, it is also sometimes very dangerous because uh, we will be in, in just a, a part of Chinese civilization if we don't resist to that power or that attraction. So it's sometimes very difficult to describe this difficulty. Previously, uh, we used, of course, the word soft power, but sometimes I said in this kind of conference that we have to be careful because Chinese soft power is sometimes dangerous. It's a contradictory because soft power is basically quite attractive. So that's why it's contradictory because China is attracting other country. Uh, at the same time, China is threatening other country or exploiting that opportunity to do something. So it's really difficult to describe that kind of a situation. That's why when I first saw the word soft power, I'm really, really glad that, well, my, my how to say, uh, quite difficult feeling uh, is now solved by that new, new concept of the sharp power. Uh, but at the same time, of course, we know that China is a really, really attractive country. And China has had a huge soft power or attraction. 
and Japanese people has been attracted by China. In 1917, soon after we signed the treaty with China, uh, we received panda. And then when I was a child, I went to the zoo to watch, to see uh, panda, Chinese panda, for the first time. But I had to wait for several hours to watch panda. <laughs> so you can easily imagine how much we were attracted by Chinese panda. And naturally, we had a very good impression of uh, China in that time, in the, in the late 1970s, more than 70 percentage of Japanese people had favorable view about China. But mm. now, more than 80 percentage of Japanese people has a really bad impression or unfavorable view about China. So it's wrong to say that Japan has been quite anti-China. It's wrong to say that, because Japan has been the biggest in total a provider of ODA and FDI, and uh, when uh, <coughs> uh, Japanese Prime Minister Kakuye Tanaka visited Beijing, and he, when he met with Chairman Mao Zedong, he apologized, I mean, Prime Minister Tanaka apologized for what we have done during the war years. We killed millions of Chinese people. But, uh, well, uh, at the time, Chairman Mao Zedong said that you, you don't have to be uh, 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 apologetic because uh, you defeated the Nationalist Party. Uh, <laughs> thanks to your <laughs> defeat, victory, uh, we can see the power. So we are, rather than that, we are grateful for uh, Japanese war effort during the war years. So not just that, actually, un unexpectedly, Chinese uh, 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 Chairman Mao Zedong said that Chinese government, Communist Party, had no willingness to ask or request war uh, 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 reparations. So the Japanese government was so shocked that uh, Chinese, just generosity of Chinese government or Chinese people. So basically, I think that at the time, China was, China was a very poor country. But the many Japanese people, particularly Japanese prime minister, foreign minister, felt a kind of a moral high ground of Chinese government or Communist Party regardless of the poverty of Chinese economy. So we, I feel that in the last 10 or 20 years, we actually saw uh, that, that a kind of a, a degeneration of Chinese morality because of the rapid economic growth. Economic competition and economic benefit profits must be the priority for Chinese people. And I think that the, because of that, China has un, un, unconsciously or unintentionally sacrificed some of the mo high morality which Chinese people showed in 1917s and 1980s. So I think partly because of this, uh, Japanese uh, people uh, changed uh, its attitude towards China, as I explained. Uh, more than 80 percentage of Japanese people now have a quite unfavorable view of China. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in the last five or ten years, uh, I think that the Japanese uh, experts in this kind of a conference has been quite uh, critical to what China has been doing. And uh, we were criticized. And uh, I think that, that in these conferences, uh, we were perhaps quite unwelcome to pro uh, profit. Uh, we, we understand China very well because in China, uh, uh, sorry, in Japan, China studies. Uh, uh, in a very, very uh, in a high standard. So that's why, uh, like my university, Keo University, has many, many good China experts. Uh, Keo has been uh, the center of China studies in Japan. So that's why, naturally, when Chinese government first asked Keo University to have a Confucius Institute, naturally we declined mm -hmm. because uh, we are cautious, because uh, we don't like to be. Uh, 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 let our student, Chinese student, being watched by Chinese government. That's why, uh, even though uh, uh, we maintain good relationship with Chinese government, I mean, Kemo University has so many academic uh, 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 exchange programs with uh, Chinese universities, but uh, we <coughs> declined to have a Confucius Institute. So it means that in the last more than 1,000 years, uh, Japanese people have been selectively uh, uh, incorporated 
Chinese civilization. Of course, Chinese civilization have good size and bad size. We don't have to uh, refuse anything, reject anything about China, because uh, China has been creating uh, many, many, producing uh, many, many benefits to us, economic benefits, uh, civilizational benefits, so many, in many ways. That's why uh, we should be glad to have this kind of influence. But at the same time, we have to be cautious. Uh, so that's why I think the Japanese approach to Chinese Shapa has been extremely cautious, unlike many other countries. And previously, even though we were criticized that we are too anti-China, but I would say that we are not anti-China. We are cautious enough because we have a long history of uh, resisting a predominant Chinese civilization to form our own Japanese national identity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move away from the single country studies to some bigger picture issues. We start with you, John. Thank you. Well, my thanks uh, to the Asan Institute for having me and uh, really commend them on essentially being soft power for South Korea. And I think with that, it's a very important case study. <laughs> uh, and also commend Asan on the 10th anniversary. It is quite a feat to build and cultivate this type of network and community. So thank you. I wanted to uh, bucket my comments in three areas. One is a diagnosis of this phenomenon. The second is to look at some of the challenges and three specific ways uh, that liberal democracies can counter smart, uh, sharp power, I should say. So diagnosis, I wanted to frame it specifically from the angle of a couple of sayings. One is, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And I think from the perspective of Russia and China, if you look at it, the bedrock democracies are easy pickings. As we've heard during the panels today, there certainly is the pre-existing marginalized voters, this idea of the inability of some of these economic models that have been the engine of these liberal democracies to uh, get over the challenge of some of these marginalized uh, uh, groups within these uh, countries. The second is with the domestic turmoil in these countries, it makes it very difficult for these bedrock democracies to do the type of coordination they need to counter the sharp power. And with this, it leads to the second quote, and that is, when your adversary is making a mistake, don't interrupt. And I think when we see the United States withdrawing from the TPP, this also creates a type of vacuum that makes it, uh, I think, quite easy for countries like Russia, and particularly China, to step into this leadership vacuum. The second is, if you look at the, the challenges here, for liberal democracies, it's a twofold challenge. One is to win elections in a fair way, as, as democracies have done in a long tradition, but also the challenge of governance. And this is an area that I'll go into the, the third part here. For Russia and China, there's also an interesting phenomenon of the 1% and the elites in these countries, where when we see the capital flight from these countries, I think it gives a sense of one of the weaknesses or contradictions of sharp power. Uh, what is happening as they export some of these tools and apply these tools in other countries, certainly there's a high level of effectiveness, but in their home countries, there is this challenge of how they deal uh, with the 1%, and I think the sign that they are uh, leaving, especially the Chinese marketplace, it gives you a sense of some of the inherent weaknesses with that model. To shift gears and look at the uh, question of how liberal democracies can counter uh, sharp power, I wanted to share with you a project that the Harvard Be uh, Belfer Center has completed. It's called uh, Defending Digital Democracy, and it's actually a playbook. It's meant to be interactive and empowering for governments at the local, state, and national levels. There are three components. One is to identify the major cyber vulnerabilities throughout the voting process. And this is a function of detailed field research that the co-director of the uh, Belfer Center conducted. Eric Rosenbach, with a background in cybersecurity, having worked at the Pentagon, essentially applied those lessons learned in terms of bolstering diplomatic pro uh, the uh, democratic processes. The second area was to give specific recommendations to better safeguard election equipment, networks, and databases. So this is very much a how-to type of playbook. And the third is it also provides guidance to help state and local officials counter information operations. And this is a direct counter to what uh, we've seen with the uh, data analytics component of things like Cambridge Analytics. I wanted to conclude with an important quote. And this is really a call to arms in many respects. And the quote goes something like this. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. So I think with this, we have to look at it from the competitive aspect of the marketplace of ideas. Mm. 
There is something that we have to move away about this entitlement of what we built with liberal democracies around the world. And really the call to arms, this idea of innovation, adaptation, and what comes next. And that is really the focus to need on the need to be competitive and through that to be influential. Thank you. Thank you. We turn now to Chris. Great. Well, thank you, Gil, and thanks also to the uh, organizers for this session and for the entire event. I thought what I would do just at the outset is, um, first of all, make the observation that the discussions today uh, really indicate how much the environment has changed. And I think this is fundamental to understanding the sorts of things that have informed the sharp power idea. The initiative we undertook very briefly uh, was done to look at authoritarian influence in spheres that are really fundamental to democratic societies. So we looked at a number of institutions and sectors in young democracies. So we purposefully did not look, for example, at how Russia is engaged in Belarus or in Armenia. Uh, likewise, in China's case, we didn't look at examples in its area that would fall into the semi-authoritarian or authoritarian space precisely because we felt, my colleagues and I, from talking to partners and just seeing what was happening in the world, that it was uh, democratic institutions and democracies <coughs> that were revealing their vulnerabilities in many of the ways that the other panelists have described, including mature democracies. And Australia, I think, is at the top of the list in this regard. And so we worked with a number of think tanks who were able to do extensive research in four countries. And just to, to boil this down, uh, they looked at the spheres of media and education, the policy institute realm, culture, um, and asked questions about the inventory of, of influence uh, tools that both Russia and China are using. I'll emphasize the China part of this. But as importantly, and I would say more, more difficult uh, to, to assess was the impact of these things and how they work. So clearly there's a lot of activity now in these areas and I'll just give a few examples um, and some of them have been touched on already and I think in Australia precisely because the independent media investigative journalists, some very courageous um, academics in that country have come forward and have spoken out and have put things into the public sphere and public domain, there's now a much clearer public record and understanding, even if the responses remain extremely complicated, the understanding of how China has insinuated itself into the country's politics, into the country's media. Um, one anecdote on this count, which is uh, explained extremely well by people like John Fitzgerald, who's written both for the Journal of Democracy and I think also for Gill's uh, journal coming out soon. And, uh, he describes this incredible series of events uh, which started in 2014 by which um, an arrangement between the Australian Broadcasting Corporation and the Shanghai Media Group, which is a Beijing media conglomerate, was come to essentially to give, at least on the surface, uh, the Australian Broadcasting Company access to uh, the Chinese audience. What happened in this arrangement was that as part of this agreement, the Australian Broadcasting Company agreed to stop its Mandarin service. It's really quite incredible. So the ABC is the analog to the BBC. And um, it was good journalism and Australians digging that brought this to the fore. There's a happy ending to this, but I just mention it because the process by which this was able to occur is really quite jarring. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine this could happen. But in the end, they restored the Mandarin service, and by all accounts today, it's doing reporting uh, without fear or favor, and it plays an extremely important role at a time when virtually all of the independent Chinese language media has either been taken over by the Chinese state or its surrogates mm -hmm. for the one million or so uh, Chinese speakers in Australia. It's really quite remarkable. So that's emblematic of this challenge of what I would describe as inducing democratic systems to censorship or self-censorship, narrowing the debate in ways that are really inconsistent with the commonly held understanding of soft power, which I think, as Jane alluded to and others, it's really about 
bringing people to expand their horizons really in the way that the Asan plenum does. Uh, when exchanges are done today, and uh, our analyst Juan Pablo Cardinal, who did research in Argentina and Peru, found that for the many thousands of people-to-people -people exchanges that the Chinese government organizes today, and it's really quite remarkable and formidable, um, the program that students, academics, policy elites, government officials, and others uh, participate in when they arrive in China tends to be one side of the story. It's uh, quite literally the party line. Uh, this is only intensified in the era of Xi Jinping, but I think it speaks to this kind of narrowing as a frame of reference rather than a broadening in this sense. Um, if we look at uh, the cultural sphere, the Confucius Institutes have been mentioned. It really straddles the education and the cultural sphere. Uh, I think the things to be concerned about, they're very controversial, the debates are very heated. They're starting to, um, I think, reach an inflection point in the United States because journalists and editorial writers have really picked up this issue. And it's, it's problematic because on the one hand, you don't want to um, block or deny legitimate academic freedom, uh, legitimate learning opportunities to enjoy the benefits of a foreign culture, in this case, Chinese culture or Chinese language instruction. I think what's most critical is the, uh, the accountability and transparency that is um, part of these arrangements. And so just to give a very quick overview of some of the things that distinguish Confucius Institutes from other initiatives, uh, the Confucius Institutes are a state-run uh, enterprise falling under Hanban, which is a piece of the Chinese propaganda apparatus. Confucius Institutes are embedded in the campuses of the universities in which they participate. So in um, the United States, for example, um, these projects will be uh, both transmitting textbooks typically coming from China. Personnel that uh, run the Confucius Institutes are vetted by Hanban, come to the uh, US under those auspices. And it's really about developing a relationship of trust between the Chinese state representatives and independent universities. And I think the question to ask is, when you look at what's occurring in the university sector in China today, uh, with all the things we know, um, what are the driving impulses of the personnel and the operating, kind of the operating software of the Confucius Institutes in uh, the universities and the democracies? And I don't think it's any surprise that professors in a number of these university settings are quite concerned because the agreements between the Confucius Institutes and the universities are typically confidential and not made available. This has been one of the principal requests of the professors, usually tenured professors, who take up the fight to say, I, I want to know at least what the arrangements are, what the agreements on the bounds of expression, if any, have been built into these agreements. And I think that's a start point. It's really looking at the kind of accountability and transparency mechanisms uh, in these settings. This, I think, is another feature that came through in our report as we thought about the distinction between the um, typical understanding of, of the soft power idea, it's uh, manipulation and camouflage. So what you'll find in the Chinese case is that think tank representatives, uh, even commercial entities that uh, appear to be autonomous, they may be nominally autonomous, but in the end there will be some relationship to the state authorities and there are certain obligations that come with that because the ability of these either um, non-commercial enterprises or commercial enterprises to flourish are based on whether they will be punished for veering from the state authorities' uh, desires or whether they'll be rewarded from fulfilling those wishes and obligations. And that translates into the way they operate uh, in foreign settings. And then maybe just a couple of concluding points. One of the, the most uh, vulnerable areas, and this was alluded to earlier, are overseas Chinese, and it's clear that this has been a focal point of um, the United Front activities and other activities keeping the uh, Chinese diaspora within the Chinese state media space. But I think what's most remarkable is how, and this is true in the case of Russia as well, 
how these efforts actually have moved beyond those communities. So in the 16 plus one context, if you look at countries like Serbia, uh, which gets very little attention in the mainstream media or from uh, scholars, uh, China is rapidly growing engagement there. Uh, there's even um, a governmental unit that was created recently in Belgrade that goes by the unwieldy but nevertheless telling title of the Department for the Coordination of Cooperation <laughs> between Belgrade and Russia and China. So they actually have a dedicated department solely for Russia and China in Serbia. Uh, it just gives a sense of how these countries are kind of responding to what they perceive as either the needs or the opportunities to engage with these large uh, authoritarian states. Likewise, in a country like the Czech Republic, which um, is seen as a, has been seen as a strong democratic performer, uh, China has made that one of the principal points of entry to the European Union within the 16 plus one context, which is just uh, to be clear, the 16 plus one is a formulation by the Chinese state which gives the sense that it's um, a grouping of 16 countries dealing with the one, which is China, but it's actually 16 separate bilateral relationships with Beijing. It's a very different thing, which puts these rather small, either new or democratic hopefuls um, in a very disadvantageous uh, position when dealing with a country of the size and power of China. In the Czech Republic, uh, for those of you who haven't followed it closely, there's a Chinese conglomerate that goes by the acronym of CEFC, CEFC Energy. If you haven't heard of it, I'd suggest Googling it. Maybe Google it with the Czech Republic. Uh, your search engine will light up with all sorts of uh, fantastic stories I couldn't make up. But it's, um, it's a surrogate that is, I think, fulfilling some of the uh, sharp power spirit that we recount in our reports um, in the media space, in the think tank space, uh, independent journalists and analysts um, are being sued by CEFC uh, for a variety of uh, different issues, uh, as is happening in Australia, by the way. Uh, the same company is pursuing these things. They're also in the news because one of the CEFC leading officials, uh, terrific reporting by the New York Times, found a corruption scandal with the leadership of Chad and Uganda connected to CEFC. So it just gives you a sense of the tentacles and the reach and the influence on these sorts of issues and how uh, it can impact uh, democratic societies. So I want to follow on a couple of the ideas that uh, John made on how to respond. I think the biggest challenge we face in the insinuation of authoritarian influence in ways that seeks to induce uh, censorship to narrow debate, limit free expression in the cultural realm, the education realm, um, the entertainment realm, the media realm, the publishing realm, um, is how to respond in a way that doesn't compromise liberal democratic values. And it's much easier said than done. And I think one of the principal distinctions between the challenge today and that of 35 or 40 years ago is that unlike during the heart of the Cold War, the ability for a country like China to be deeply embedded in the democracies, uh, commerce, in technology, in politics, in media, is qualitatively different. And uh, this was seen 20 or 25 years ago as a really good thing. And I think as other people during the day have alluded to, the assumption was that this sort of deep integration would, maybe with one step forward, two steps back, over time lead to political liberalization and ostensibly democratization it hasn't happened. I think if anything, the, the punctuation point to this was Xi Jinping's 19th party conference speech, the removal of the uh, norm of term limits, which sends a very different signal. And I think some, in some ways it signals that the uh, assumptions that so many of us held um, at the end of the 1980s uh, have really been repudiated, at least for now. That could change, but I think with that has to come some fresh thinking along the lines of some of the ideas that have been shared by other panelists, but I think finding ways to um, engage more deeply, not to isolate, engage more deeply, but in ways that are consistent with democratic principles should be the underlying uh, guiding spirit in any sort of response. 
Well, thank you. What a cutting edge panel for an issue that is so timely. I have two questions, but instead of asking you to respond directly to those, I will open this up for others to ask questions too, and then you can respond uh, together to, uh, to what's been asked. My first question is, um, <coughs> given Russia's su extraordinary success with its sharp power and uh, the, the weakness of the pushback there, do we expect uh, China to intensify its sharp power efforts, despite the fact there's been the kind of pushback that several of you talked about? Uh, do, we, do we have a sense of where China is going next uh, after uh, it's had some problems in, in, in New Zealand, Australia, Canada? Uh, we've heard about Japan. Uh, do, or uh, do we... we, we, we we see a, a sort of a, a revised notion of sharp power, maybe learning some lessons from Russia in the Chinese case. So that's one question, future-oriented. The second question is, isn't the big picture here, a view, in particularly in East Asia, a view of history? And first the Chinese say, no Dalai Lama visit. Then they say, Goguryeo is China rather than Korea. Um, but isn't a, a more fundamental divide, the Korean War? And hasn't China, as I've just seen in a paper uh, given by a Chinese academic at the uh, um, AAS for KEI, hasn't China basically said it's not going to reinterpret the Korean War by objectively indicating that it was an attack by um, by uh, North Korea with approval from China and Russia, instead cautiously coming up with some notion of objective reality which really isn't objective at all and doesn't get at the big picture. And isn't the Chinese goal to change the historical narrative as one of the big dimensions of national identity, particularly in East Asia, particularly because it relates to Sino-centrism and the traditional Chinese relationship to the countries in the region. And uh, isn't Korea going to be under intense pressure, perhaps with North Korea uh, finding some common ground with China to, um, to, to at least not offend the Chinese by what they say. You can just imagine the Chinese students in the classroom coming in and saying, uh, to challenging the professor who wants to talk about the origins of the Korean War and some other mm. issues the way we've seen in Australia. Okay, we're turning now to questions from you and we'll turn to, uh, back to our speakers uh, when uh, we have already picked up a, a gr group of questions. Please let me know if you have a question. Leif? Excellent panel, especially given the time of day. You are all to be commended. <laughs> Leif Eric Easley, Ihua Women's University and the Asan Institute. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel about the case of Taiwan, which has not been raised yet. Uh, obviously a, an important but different case uh, for the way that it's seen in Beijing as uh, uh, a province to be reintegrated with the mainland over some uh, period of, of many, many years. Uh, obviously a different case than the ones that we've discussed here, but I wonder if the panelists have observed some similar tactics or maybe even strategies in the deployment of uh, Chinese sharp power campaigns in the cases they've studied and the Taiwan case. In particular, if some sharp power efforts in Taiwan that were found to be successful or not successful were then uh, an opportunity for learning of how China might deploy its uh, sharp power and some of the other targets that we've discussed. Thank you very much. Okay, another question, yes, up there. Uh, thank you, I'm In Sing Kei, uh, University of North Korean, at University of North Korean Studies. Um, my question is, how do you place the role of national intelligence services in this context? Because uh, I think some of those uh, you know, Chinese uh, sharp power activities are quite subtle, but the others are quite blatant and even, you know, very, um, very blunt activities. 
So there must be some role for the intelligence service to, to counter those uh, initiatives, and particularly after the you know 911 in the U.S., for instance, a uh, huge debate and a lot of policy measures have been done uh, in terms of you know domestic. Um, you know, a lot of controversies as well regarding domestic surveillance and uh, counterterrorism, but all those discussions that seems to be missing in this, uh, you know, discussion with the Chinese um, sharp power. Thank you. And there was another question here. Yes, please. Good evening, and thank you for your uh, presentation tonight. Uh, since you mentioned China's presence in uh, Eastern Europe and more particularly on the Balkan Peninsula, I wanted to ask uh, what is your opinion on why China is targeting this region. Since I'm from Bulgaria and recently there has been a case where a um, big Chinese conglomerate bought uh, an airport in my country and uh, it is believed that they are uh, participating in more auctions about uh, buying more airports and tr uh, transportation centers in the country. I would uh, like to ask you uh, on your opinion about that, why China is trying to confirm its presence in that region. Thank you. Okay, we have about two minutes per, per speaker. Why don't we uh, start with you? Gun. Okay, sure about the Chinese next move, I think that China will become much more sophisticated in using their power, whether it's blunt or sharp, because they have seen the counterproductive of using their economic power in this case. And also, actually, especially actually, when they saw the South Korean response on the sad retaliation, instead of the KB into the Chinese demand, actually, South Korean stood firm on this case. Actually, uh, if you look out the, the, the public Actually, actually, for the first time, China actually was below Japan in terms of country favorability after things are said. Of course, China has gone up a little bit again. But anyhow, that kind of feeling is, is there. So it seems to me that China is going to be much more sophisticated and also uh, in, uh, <coughs> inclined to use this kind of charming video again. Actually, for example, for 2008, actually, we were very favorable to China. China, for the, actually, after the starting diplomatic relations with China in 1992, 25 years, such amazing years, we have a kind of very romantic view of China. But it's very unlikely we go back to that image again. So China knows that fact. So they try to create their different image of China. Uh, that's the first one, so we should be very careful what China will do. Of course, we ha I haven't seen any kinds of fake news or the things like that. But anyhow, there could be some cases. Based upon my observation, the, the, this, the spread of the information about that system or technicality, all this, because it's given by the Chinese side. So maybe there could be manipulation of information coming from China. How we are going to deal with it, I don't know exactly, because actually the, our uh, capability is quite limited in this time, and also Chinese power. So we will see what will happen. But about this history issue, I think that we, I don't think China will rewrite the history because they, they have two Koreas, North Korea and South Korea. So it's very unlikely for Chinese history, but actually they, we know some, some small portion of Korean public know that we have history dispute with China when they actually will, uh, talk about the Koguryo issue that actually ignited national feeling in, in South Korea. So if that's the case, I think maybe China will fail, definitely. So very, it is very unlikely China to revive the history issue again and also use that as a way to, uh, to form the strength in the domestic uh, solidarity in China. And Taiwan case, I don't know exactly, because actually they treat Taiwan as just part of China, but they are using the, the economic power again to Taiwan uh, more bluntly, because this, this is a really different case from the others. Uh, uh, let me stop there, thank you. Yuichi. Thank you very much. I like to respond to a guild questions. I I think that China will not stop using sharp power for a couple of reasons. First, basically, I think that sharp power is a child of globalization and the spread of internet. So, unlike before, I think that the China can use that power, and the China needs to use that power because basically, I think that the exercise of Sharp pie by Chinese government is a defensive measure, defensive measure to defend China's own regime. 
political system because nowadays, because of the globalization, largely because of the globalization, the boundary between domestic political and domestic society and foreign countries are diminishing. That's why it's very easy for uh, China to compare Chinese society with other countries. And I think that the Chinese government perhaps <coughs> fully understands that democratic society is more uh, desirable and uh, uh, has much better image than Chinese communist regime, even though China has a confidence in its nationalism and its national power and so on. But uh, basically, I think that the many young Chinese people feel that, uh, uh, well, democratic society is much more desirable. That's why it's sometimes important for China to change the attitudes of Chinese people, particularly in foreign countries. That's why it's necessary for Chinese government for defensive purpose to continue to exercise that power. But actually, it wastes huge amount of Chinese budget and money uh, with no particular results in many ways. So that's why I think that uh, it would be suicidal to continue using that power, sharp power, in foreign countries. But uh, maybe I think that China will use much more uh, sophisticated means. Sophisticated means mean, mean that it is more difficult to find that China is exercising sharp power. So that's why we have to be more cautious. We have to be cleverer, otherwise, it's easy for China to penetrate its sharp power into democratic society because more open society is more vulnerable. That's why, like United States, European country, these countries are really open. That's why they are vulnerable. Uh, John. Sure. Uh, so uh, some of some of the uh, questions were, were uh, answered here. I wanted to directly uh, respond to what's the role of intelligence agencies to counter uh, sharp power. In the United States, there there is an effort. Uh, to certainly bolster efforts to protect, but also to increase defenses. And that's really to close gaps on vulnerabilities. Uh, and two ways to do that, one is awareness, uh, and that's the uh, digital, Defending Digital Democracy Project at the Harvard Belfer Center. But also there is a growing movement towards increasing legislation. Uh, and this is a regulatory aspect of tech companies as well as social media. This is where we saw the awkward visual of a young person like Mark Zuckerberg testifying in Congress and trying to explain things to 70, 80 year old senators. Uh, but the regulatory aspect of it, I think, is another means to uh, bolster these capabilities. Uh, but it is the broader movement of uh, trying to move away just by the focus on protection and looking at other uh, aspects where individuals, companies, different organizations can take ownership of this idea of reducing vulnerabilities. Um, I'll just respond to your interesting question about why the Chinese are buying up airports in Bulgaria. I mean, <laughs> it might sound like a fairly remote, remote idea, but I, th I think that this is a pattern in many countries. Uh, China is buying up or trying to buy up critical infrastructure. I know in Australia, for example, that they tried to buy up uh, utilities in uh, electrical, electric utilities in a number of states, Australia is a, a federation. And uh, I think the Australian federal government figured out that if it continued that the Chinese would basically run the Australian electrical system, which is not a satisfactory situation for any foreign power to run an essential, an essential utility. So I think a law has been introduced that no foreign power can have so much of an electric in, uh, utility. And so I think uh, that's one example. I think in Bulgaria, they're probably buying it up, critical infrastructure. Nice to be able to control it. I might just add on that. I think in uh, these cases of countries that are in the EU and NATO, it's also a pathway for China when it builds relationships uh, into those two um, bodies, which is, it was explicit when uh, China started developing its activities in the Czech Republic. I suspect Bulgaria has a dimension of that. Maybe just to answer Gil's question and to wrap Taiwan into that, I think in hindsight, one of the things you see in, in the Russian case is that much of what we came to see in um, places farther afield, farther west of Russia's westernmost border 
were um, experimented with by trial and error within the Russian Federation first. So um, bloggers, independent journalists, activists, all, of, all suffered um, various forms of uh, online attacks, among other things. But in particular, in the digital realm, these sorts of methods were tested domestically, and then you saw them applied in the Baltic states and then in Central Europe. And I think, you know, people sitting, if we were having this conversation, say, in a decade ago, and someone would have said, uh, Russia will be inside the major tech platforms and the electoral system of the United States, people would have said, you're crazy. And so I think one of the things to look at is, is how that's diffused and tested. In China's case, from what I understand, these sorts of experiments are being, have been started in Taiwan in the digital space. The advantage there is the uh, language, uh, the shared language, um, and other advantages that come with that. But I think we, we should keep our imaginations open on these things um, because the relative cost of undertaking these sorts of exercises, certainly in a digital realm, for the potential payoff from the view of uh, governments that aren't really checked domestically on these sorts of things. There is no meaningful accountability for the Chinese authorities in determining uh, surveillance, for example. Chinese citizens have no say in that. Uh, in Xinjiang and Tibet, um, some of the most sophisticated surveillance, uh, facial recognition, um, AI sorts of um, things are being developed, which clearly are being road tested there for expansion into the rest of the PRC. Um, if you read Nadej Roland's recent book, her last chapter looks at what a kind of Chinese order in Eurasia would look like in the future. And um, for my taste, it's not a pretty picture on these sorts of issues. I commend everyone to that book. But I think this notion that um, somehow this must stop or there will be um, some sort of internal check, I think we have to think very carefully about that. I think unless the costs imposed from the outside or the safeguarding uh, taken within democracies is sufficient enough, I see no reason why decision makers in a system uh, which don't have checks on their power would alter their behavior. I hope I'm wrong, though. <laughs> I would leave, uh, leave you with one final thought. Um, I think we should expect the intensification of sharp power, and to the extent that countries become divided in their national identities, lack co a cohesive sense of that identity, and I think that's what's happened increasingly in the United States, even in the last year and a half, they are more vulnerable mm. to the sharp power. And therefore, if we don't understand the linkages between sharp power and identity and smart power, I think we are leaving ourselves uh, in a uh, compromised situation. Thank you all for attending, and thank the panelists for their presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes all of our sessions for today. Thank you for staying late tonight, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you again, and have a great night.